Andrew Rube Foster. You will hear why he is noted as one of the best in baseball, black or white. The United States Postal Service issued two stamps in commemoration of Negro League's baseball in 2010, one featuring Andrew Foster. We know about Jackie Robinson, who became the first black American to play Major League Baseball in the modern era. Perhaps you've heard of Satchel Paige, who was a Negro pitcher, a legend in his own lifetime. But the person with the greatest impact upon African American baseball is the less known Andrew Foster, who was generally considered not only one of the greatest pitchers and managers of the early 20th century, but also the architect of the National Negro League. Despite facing immense racial prejudice, Foster persisted as a player, manager, and team owner with such distinction that he earned the title Father of Negro Baseball. Andrew Foster was born in Calvert, Texas in 1879 to Andrew Foster Sr. and Sarah Foster. His father was a minister at the Methodist Episcopal Church. Not much is known of his childhood. He was a first generation born out of slavery and like most blacks of that time, he and his family experienced the pains of racial prejudice. Foster was the fourth of six children, but only three survived until adulthood. His siblings died during a rampant tuberculosis epidemic. Ironically, Foster claims that fear of succumbing to the disease by spending more time indoors fed his passion to play baseball. Outdoors, away from the disease, was the recommended precaution issued by the community physician. As a boy, he was drawn to the sport, causing him to organize a neighborhood team, something he would continue to do his entire life. Andrew's mother died shortly before he finished eighth grade, and his father remarried and moved away from Calvert. This was not agreeable to Andrew, where everything dear to him remained. At the age of 14, Foster quit school and ran away from home to pursue his goal of a career playing baseball. I'm not a baseball follower, but I was impressed with Foster's career stats. He started his professional career in Texas with the Waco Yellow Jackets, an independent black team in 1897. Tall and powerful, Foster was an imposing figure on the pitcher's mound. Over the next few years, he gradually built up a reputation among white and black fans alike until he was signed with the Chicago Union Giants in 1902. This was a team in the top ranks of Midwest black baseball. Foster struggled in his first professional season, eventually earning his release from the club. That same year, he signed with an interracial semi-pro team in Michigan. It was there that Foster first flashed his tremendous ability, and because of his success, he was recruited by the Cuban ex-Giants for the start of the 1903 season. Immediately, he became their ace pitcher. In his first full season with the club, Foster helped the ex-Giants to the Black Baseball Championship, defeating his future team, the Philadelphia Giants. Now a star, Foster jumped to the Philadelphia Giants for the 1904 season. During this season, Foster won 20 games against all competition, including two no-hitters, and lost only six games. In a rematch with Foster's old team, the Cuban ex-Giants, he won two games and batted 400, leading the Philadelphia Giants to the black championship over his former team. As Foster's reputation as an outstanding pitcher began to spread, the feats and stories surrounding this imposing six foot two, 200 pound right-hander became legendary. Foster was credited with a 51 to four record for the 1905 season. However, these stats may be exaggerated. How Foster acquired the nickname Rube. The story goes Foster won this nickname as a result of a best of the best contest between him 
and white Philadelphia Athletics Hall of Famer George Waddell, who was nicknamed Rube. In a 1902 postseason exhibition game, Foster outpitched Waddell, and with the victory, he claimed the nickname Rube as his middle name for the rest of his life. Foster's exploits earned him the respect of fellow white ball players in the major leagues. Frank Chance, a white first baseman for the Chicago Cubs and New York Yankees, said, quote, Foster is the most finished product I've ever seen in the pitcher's box, end quote. Honus Wagner, a white player for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who is widely considered one of the best players of all time, said, quote, Foster was one of the greatest pitchers of all times, end quote. In 1905, Foster led the Philadelphia Giants to another championship series victory, this time over the Brooklyn Royal Giants. The Philadelphia Telegraph wrote that, quote, Foster has never been equaled in a pitcher's box. The following season, the Philadelphia Giants helped form the International League of Independent Professional Ballplayers, composed of both all-black and all-white teams in the Philadelphia and Wilmington, Delaware areas. In 1907, Foster's Philadelphia Giants manager, Saul White, published his official baseball guide, History of Colored Baseball with Foster, contributing an article on how to pitch. However, before the season began, Foster and several other stars were pulled away to play for the Chicago Leland Giants, and Foster was named playing manager. Foster's ambitions in baseball went beyond his amazing talent on the mound. He wanted to extend his talents into the dugout and the front office. Taking on the position of player manager for the Leland Giants, Foster's pitching and managing helped lead the Giants to win a phenomenal 110 games, including 48 straight and only 10 losses. They won the Chicago City League pennant. The following season, the Leelands tied a national championship series with the Philadelphia Giants, each winning three games. As a manager and team owner, Foster dominated the field and the team. He was a disciplinarian who asserted control over every aspect of the game, and he set high standards of personal conduct, appearance, and professionalism among his players. Foster was renowned for his use of intimidation and psychology. He developed a style of play that emphasized speed, bunting, place hitting, power pitching, and defense. To play for Rube Foster, you had to be able to bunt into a hat. What does that mean? Rube would put two hats out on the field, one between the pitcher's mound and first base, the other between the mound and third. If you couldn't hit a bunt down into one of these two hats, you wouldn't make the team. Foster was considered a great teacher and many of his players eventually became team managers. But Foster wanted more. He tried to take control of the Leland Giants from Frank Leland during the 1909-1910 offseason. After splitting with Leland, he put together his own team for the 1910 season. He signed players away from both the Leland Giants and the Philadelphia Giants to form the Chicago American Giants. Foster considered this to be the best baseball talent ever assembled. He managed and pitched for the Giants, leading them to an astounding record of 128 wins and six losses. The following 1911 season, Foster sought and gained a handshake partnership with White Sox owner, Charles Kaminsky's son-in-law, John Sorling. Sorling agreed to allow the team to play at the Sox Old Stadium, Southside Park, and split profits 50-50. Through this partnership, along with Foster's playing, managing, and ownership skills, the Chicago American Giants became the most prominent black baseball team in America. By 1915, Foster was pitching very little as he focused his efforts on team operations. 
Foster's last recorded appearance on the mound was in 1917. His efforts paid off. Foster's Giants claimed the Western League Championship for all seasons between 1910 and 1922, with the exception of a defeat to Indianapolis in 1916. Yet despite all his personal success, Foster wanted to see a national black baseball championship and a national black baseball league. Seeking to unite black American baseball, Foster began to put out feelers to other black owners during the 1910s, but found the owners were unable to come to any sort of agreement. In 1919, Foster helped finance a new club in Detroit, the Stars. He also transferred several of his veteran players there to manage the new team. Perhaps he was preparing the way for the formation the following year of the Negro National League. Also in 1919, Chicago was in the midst of violent race riots. Rather than discourage Foster, he vowed to demonstrate that they could improve black American life. Foster empathized with his fellow black Americans who felt mistreated at the hands of white Americans. The race riot spurred Foster to finally push through the formation of a Negro National League. He gathered all the owners together in Kansas City and helped hammer out an agreement among the owners. The Negro National League was founded in 1920 through Foster's unceasing efforts. He helped to form the first Black Baseball League and assumed a leadership position. Therefore, it was Andrew Foster who helped establish the first successful professional league for African-American players. Now, the league is formed. What next? A baseball league was formed and Foster was at the helm. A formula for controversy. Foster was periodically accused of favoring his own team, especially in matters of scheduling, citing that the Giants in the early years tended to have a disproportionate number of home games, and there were personnel issues as well. Foster seemed able to acquire whatever talent he needed from other clubs, such as Jimmy Lyons, the Detroit Stars' best player in 1920, who was transferred to the American Giants for the 1921 season, and Foster's own younger brother Bill, who joined the American Giants unwillingly when Rube forced the Memphis Red Sox to give him up in 1926. His critics believed he had organized the league primarily for purposes of booking games for the American Giants. But it was Foster who worked to create stable playing schedules, reasonably solve at teams, and to improve receipts at the gate. It was also true that when opposing clubs lost money, Foster was known to help them meet payrolls, sometimes out of his own pocket. The league's initial members included teams in Dayton, St. Louis, Detroit, Kansas City, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Foster's own team in Chicago. He was elected the first president and treasurer of the league. Despite complaints, Foster was a well-respected leader who turned black baseball into a successful enterprise. His devotion to the, to the league was incredible. Teams such as the Chicago American Giants and Kansas City Monarchs often were more profitable than white baseball teams. Foster's tenure as president laid the groundwork for the future success of the Negro Leagues. On a personal note, Foster married Sarah Watts, with whom he had two children. Little information exists about Foster's marriage. Most, most biographers simply excluded mention of his family. The marriage certificate for Sarah and Andrew has yet to be found, but it seems likely that they married either in Texas or Illinois in 1909 or 1910. Foster's children, son Earl and daughter Sarah, lived with him in Illinois throughout his baseball career. His wife knew little about Foster's playing career or baseball business ventures, but she was not a fan of the game herself. Miles Lewis Thomas was a young white right-handed pitcher for the New York Yankees in 1927. He was nicknamed Duckeye by the great Yankees hitter, Babe Ruth. 
He wrote a diary to document his 1927 Yankees baseball season that spanned from uh, April to October that included stories of baseball, jazz, and prohibition. Here we also read about his amazing encounter and admiration of Andrew Foster. The story is found in The Diary of Miles Thomas and is entitled Andrew Rube Foster and the Ride to Kankakee. May 11, 1927, Chicago. Here is his story in his words. I will interject identities of those mentioned. Before Benny Morton, a New York City jazz trombonist, during the swing era, first told me stories about Andrew Rube Foster last season, I didn't know much about the man. Morton is in Chicago for a couple of weeks, and he's been sitting in with Louis Armstrong's band. So the last two nights, Benny Bingo, a white baseball player and coach with the Yankees, and I went to see him play. Also sitting in was Jimmy Yancey, a great colored pianist. He was a boogie-woogie pianist, composer, and lyricist living in Chicago. Bingo and I knew Yancey enough to say hello because he's a member of the White Sox grounds crew at Kaminsky Park. Because Armstrong and the members of his band are such crazy baseball fans, both nights between sets, drinks, and Armstrong's Mary Jane cigarettes, we talked a lot of baseball. And a lot of our conversation was about Andrew Rube Foster. I knew Foster was the commissioner of the first Negro League and by far the most important person in black baseball, but I didn't know his full story. After listening to Armstrong, Yancey, and Morton, and talking about Foster with the babe, Babe Ruth, and Miller Huggins, Yankees manager, it's clear to me that Andrew Rue Foster must have been one of the most amazing men ever, colored or white, in or out of baseball. Jimmy Yancey had known Foster the longest, and he told of Foster's early life and baseball career. Rube Foster was a man when he was 17 years old. That's when he left home for good, just before the turn of the century, carrying a baseball bat on his shoulder and a pair of Texas six guns around his waist. He was tough and already 200 pounds. Foster started playing baseball in Texas. Then he moved up north, and by the early 1900s, he was the best colored pitcher of his time. He wrote, The Babe says Foster taught the great Christy Matheson, a white pitcher for the New York Giants, how to throw his remarkable fadeaway pitch. As a manager, Foster was as smart as John McGraw, who was a player and manager of the New York Giants, nicknamed Little Napoleon. In fact, McGraw used to come to Chicago to watch the American Giants play, and he was always watch Foster training his team. Foster had a number of really innovative drills. John McGraw really admired Foster's baseball mind. And there ain't a lot of minds the little Napoleon admires, at least not in baseball. It must have been a sight to see the two greatest baseball managers, one black and one white, talking about strategy and drills and what managers call inside baseball. Benny Morton says that Foster didn't take a salary for running the league. Instead, he took 10% sometimes more, of all the gate receipts. He lived loudly, but he also used his money to keep the teams afloat, and he paid his players well. He went on to tell us that something happened. A couple of years ago, Foster almost died from a gas leak. Maybe the gas did something to his brain, or maybe something else did it. But he started getting paranoid and sometimes violent. He had always kept his six-shooters nearby, the ones he put on when he left his childhood home in Texas, but now he wore them out everywhere. 
He also started seeing things and having strange conversations. Finally, it got so bad that last year his family committed him to the state asylum in Kankakee, about 60 miles south of Chicago. His family doesn't have any money because Kaminsky's son-in-law went back on his word. His deal with Foster was done on a handshake. And as seems to happen when white and black hands shake on deals, the black hand was left holding nothing but air. Foster's 50% partnership evaporated, and now the family's run out of money. Jimmy Yancey told us he tries to go down to the asylum every other week or so just to make sure that Foster is being properly cared for at the institution. Miles Thomas asked if he could go with Yancey and Morton to visit Mr. Foster. Armstrong gave a nod of permission, and early Thursday morning, we set out for Kankakee. Conversation in the car was lively, and Benny even pulled out his trombone and played while Jimmy drove. They were admitted to Foster's room, and the mood became somber. Foster was alone in his almost bare room, lying on his side in his bed. The encounter was startling to Miles, yet the utmost respect and honor was rendered to this great man and hero. Sadly, it was also woefully painful to see such a commanding man succumb to the demands of his displaced reality. Miles Thomas wrote that the ride back to Chicago was much quieter than the ride out to Kankakee. Foster died at the asylum in 1930. His wife Sarah and his son Earl survived him. His daughter died prior to her father. Almost 3,000 people honored his life at his funeral in Chicago. In 1981, Andrew Rue Foster was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. 